All right, good morning, everybody. Thanks for taking time out of your Saturday to uh, come and hear some uh, talks, and hopefully um, the science that you hear about today will excite you, uh, get you interested in the topic, and just show you the sort of the diversity um, of, of the application of physics uh, in the study of science. So I'm a biophysicist, um, and broadly speaking, I'm interested in how the laws of physics help to shape what biology can do. Um, and so I've studied a wide range of topics, uh, all the way from um, how tissues get developed to what I'll tell you about today, which is uh, uh, how things move at the cellular scale. Um, and <clears throat> the main thing that, that I want you to take away from today, if you, if you take nothing away about like what I tell you about my research, hopefully what you take away is that the way water behaves for things that are really, really small is way different than we experience water. And the intuition you have for how you experience water from your everyday life is completely wrong in terms of how water actually behaves for things at the microscopic scale. And so that's what uh, this demonstration will do. Um, it's a bit magical, and uh, so I, I, um, uh, I hope that it, it, it provides some wow factor. Um, and rewards you for, for taking some time out on, on a Saturday. So these are some of the uh, <coughs> examples. They even got, have some movies of um, uh, things moving around uh, at, the, at the cellular scale. So we're all very familiar with viruses these days. Uh, the picture on the left is, uh, is a, uh, a rendition of some viruses floating around in the, in the body and trying to invade one of your cells. So how does a virus uh, interact with your cell and move around? Um, the other uh, images are of um, the patterning of tiny little molecules on the surface of a bacteria. So how does these molecules fight against the random forces that are kicking things around in a chemical system and yet still be able to pattern its space? Um, and then these are bacteria swimming around, and they look like they're swimming around just like we would swim in water, but that's what the hope of my demonstration is to show you today, is that actually how they um, uh, experience swimming in water is very, very different than us, and the strategies that you then need to develop in order to swim in water at that scale are also very different than how we swim in water. Whoops. Click on this one again. And then this is a picture of a, of a neuron, and you can see that there are things in green there being trafficked in very directed fashion. Um, and so what are the, what are the entities that uh, cause this directed transport uh, at the cellular scale? So four things I want to talk to you about is, I hope by the end, if you had to swim in honey, you would know how to do it. Second thing, I'll give you some case uh, studies about how things actually move at the cellular scale and some of the strategies that nature uh, has for um, overcoming some of the physical obstacles that are imposed on it. Um, the main topic of, of my own research that I want to tell you about today is, is a, a mechanism uh, for moving things around at the cellular scale that uses, um, I guess, the, the cartoon of a burning bridge um, so that if, if you're on a track and, the, and the, the track is burning behind you, well, you can't very well go back towards, you wouldn't want to go back towards the burning track, right? So the only way that you should go is to keep moving forward. And we'll see that there's chemistry inside the cell that basically implements uh, such a system so that the object that's being transported keeps moving in a directed way. And then lastly, what a lot of, you know, once we study a scientific problem and we figure out sort of how the system is behaving, we have some ideas for the mechanisms, the next step is to try to engineer things. And so um, it then moves into the realm of engineering of trying to take these ideas from biology um, to try to engineer uh, microscale uh, lawnmowers or, or objects that are operating using this burnt bridges style mechanism. So, <clears throat> Life is water, um, 
and lots of living things uh, live in water. And the way we experience water is not at all how these microscopic uh, organisms or microscopic objects experience water. So we need to talk a little bit about water. So water is a liquid at biological temperatures. Um, and what are two properties that characterize a liquid? Well, there's only two. There's its density, which is simply a measure of how much mass how much matter there is in a particular volume. And there's something called viscosity, which in a very simple terms is really a measure of how sticky the molecules are that are in the liquid. And I'm going to give you two examples of liquids which we experience in everyday life. So on the left is coffee, which is basically just water. And you'll see that the density of water, if you recall from high school, a liter of water weighs a kilogram. So there's one kilogram of matter within one liter of water. That's its density. Well, what about its viscosity? So it's got viscosity as some fancy units, which you don't really have to um, take note of. But in those units, it has a viscosity of one. Now, what about honey? Whoops. Note that honey. The density of honey, honey is essentially, it's a biological, you know, it's generated by biology. Biology is essentially composed mostly of water. So honey is predominantly just water, and so it has a density very similar to that of water. However, the things that are dissolved in honey, the various proteins and so forth, are very sticky. They interact strongly. And so, again, not paying too much attention to the units, but the viscosity of water is about 5,000 to 10,000 times bigger than that of water. So honey and water have very similar densities, but their viscosity orders by many orders of magnitude. So honey's a lot stickier. And what I want to uh, show you today is what are the implications of viscosity in how things experience um, a liquid? And so this is a demo that I have here. So here I just have uh, in this beaker, um, this is just tap water. And I'm going to do what many of you might do with your coffee in the morning by putting in some cream. And instead of cream, I've got just some food coloring. And you can see that it made a splash and it's sort of swirling around in there. And now I'm going to take this little stir stick and mix it up. And you might, and it mixes in pretty well, and now I basically just have green water. And I swirled it in a, what direction is that? A uh, clockwise way. How many of you think if I swirl this in the clockwise way that I'll get back my original drop of food coloring? Anybody? Okay, You're, you've already you know, experienced this every day in your life. So if I, go if I go in the reverse direction, it's still mixed up, right? I can't get back my original drop of uh, food coloring. <coughs> However, in this container, I don't have honey. I have another substance, which is um, got a viscosity which is very similar to honey. So it's got a viscosity that's probably five to 10,000 times bigger than the viscosity of, of water. So it's very sticky. I've got some of it here. You can see it sort of sloshes around, but it sloshes around like honey. It moves slower uh, than, than water. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a drop out of it. And um, I never did any chemistry or biology at university, so my skills are, are not great, but we'll see what I can do. All right. So I've got some dye in this pipette, and I'm going to stick it down. Oops, that's the wrong way. Again, don't get me to do experiments. So 
I put, what do we have there? Is there a dot and a streak? You can see that there's a dot and there's sort of a line, right? And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to stir this liquid in a, I'll do clockwise first. <laughs> so there's a stir stick on top. And if I stir it, so that's once around, twice around, three times around, four times around, five times around, six times around. And you can see it's been mixed in to the liquid. Not as much as in the water, but you, can, you know, I've, we've mixed it to some degree. What if I now reverse my action? Is that the ring that I see that appears there? Yeah, see, so the, 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 drop, the drop has now been completely smeared out, sort of into a band in this liquid. Now I'm going to reverse my action by going in the other way. And I've got the drop back. What's inside of the water? It's, gl it's, it's glycerin. Uh, glycerin, but it basically has the same viscosity of honey. It's, so it's about 10,000 times more viscous than. But, but you're dissolving it in water. Is that what, what's. No, so, this is, so this, is, this is dye, and it's also in glycerin. So, oh. so, oh, okay. so I've, I've injected food coloring, which is mixed in glycerin and deposited the dye molecule. So the, what's relevant is the dye molecule. Um, and this happens to be dye molecule, which is in glycerin. But you can see that for some reason, I was able to unmix the, uh, the liquid. I was, un I was able to return um, the molecules back to roughly their original state. So remember, the molecules themselves, the dye molecules themselves are the same thing. In one situation, I put these dye molecules, which are very tiny, right? They're molecules, so they're, you know, uh, nanometers in size. One time I put it uh, in water, which has very low viscosity, and I mixed it. So, and then the second time, I put the same dye molecules, so they're still the same tiny little things, but I put them in a liquid which was extremely viscous, but I also stirred it with roughly the same stirring speed. One case, you couldn't unmix it. The other case, you could unmix it. So what's going on? Why, why are these two liquids behaving so differently when it comes to this, this dynamic process of mixing? And this is in case the demo didn't work. <laughs> um, and, and it did. So what, uh, what is hard to visualize and what we don't experience every day um, in our everyday lives with, with water is that when we see water and we put something like cream into our coffee, we see very sort of swirly and turbulent uh, behavior of the cream as it mixes into the water. What we just saw with the unmixing is a completely different regime of how moving, water, moving liquid behaves, and it's so, the so-called laminar flow regime. And, uh, if you two behave. So here is some fluid which is moving past this object. And instead of seeing all these sort of swirly, turbulent flow, um, you see this very nice laminar, smooth flow around the object. And so the takeaway is that liquid when something is moving through it, can behave in two very dramatically different ways. When something is moving through it, it can either, behave, it, it can either move the liquid in a turbulent fashion, which is actually how we experience wa moving through water, uh, as I'll show, or it can move in this, in this way, which we typically don't have much experience with at all in our everyday lives, which is this laminar way, where the fl flow is very uh, um, smooth. And you can characterize, this is the only equation that appears in this whole talk, uh, and I've written it out in words, 
how water or how a liquid behaves when something is moving through it is characterized by something known as the Reynolds number. And it depends upon four things. Remember, a liquid is characterized by its density and its viscosity. So you can see that the liquid density appears in the numerator. So if I make the liquid more dense, that's going to increase the Reynolds number. It also it, uh, depends upon the viscosity of the liquid. The viscosity goes in the denominator of the Reynolds number. So if I make the viscosity bigger, the Reynolds number goes down. And just to get to the punchline, if the Reynolds number is big, you get turbulent flow. If the Reynolds number is small, you get laminar flow. Our everyday experience with water is always in the turbulent regime, always in the high Reynolds number regime. But light, microscopic things experience water on the completely opposite scale, which is the low Reynolds number regime and, the, and is the uh, laminar flow. But it, as I said, it, it also depended on two other things. So not just the water, but it depends upon the object that's actually moving through the water. And that also goes in the numerator. So it depends upon the size of the object. So on the right there, there's a sphere. So the bigger the sphere, the bigger the Reynolds number. And uh, the speed of the object. So again, if you move faster, that's increasing your Reynolds number. So if, you if you're if you're swimming really fast, you have a higher chance of having a higher Reynolds number and hence more turbulent flow. So Reynolds number depends not just on the liquid, but how big and how fast that object is moving. So water, so I just said that, let's do a simple calculation. How do we experience water? So take a, so there's four things in the Reynolds number. Um, there's the viscosity and the density. And we're going to consider in all case, we're in the top and the bottom, we're going to consider water. So water's density and viscosity is going to be fixed. But we're going to change the size and the speed of the swimmer. So on the top is us, us swimming in water. So typically, we move at about a meter per second going through water. And our size is about a meter in, in size. If you plug those numbers along with the parameters for water into the equation for the Reynolds number, you get a number of about 10 to the fifth, 100,000. Uh, 100, That's very far into the turbulent regime. So we, when we're swimming, water is always moving turbulently around us. However, and if for those of you who might remember Mythbusters, which I don't think is on anymore, but they actually tried to do this. They tried to swim in honey. Um, if you tried to swim in honey, so everything stayed about the swimmer stays the same, but you change the viscosity, which is about 10,000 times bigger, uh, your Reynolds number would drop to about 10, and honey would actually be moving in a very smooth fashion as you're trying to swim, swim through the water. We'll see what consequences that has uh, on the next slide. And then lastly, this is the main point about how small things experience water very differently than us. If you take a humble bacteria, so they're about a, a micron in size, so a million times smaller than us. They also move about a million times slower in water. It's fast for them, right? <laughs> they're a million times smaller, but they're actually taking steps that are about two or three times their length. Um, so on their scale, it's, they're actually moving pretty fast. But nevertheless, a million times slower in size, a million times slower in uh, speed, plug in the same parameters for water, your Reynolds number now works out to 10 to the minus 5, very much less than 1, so extremely small. And so they, um, living things, things on that scale experience water very much in the laminar regime. So what consequences does that have? So again, physics imposes constraints on what biology can do. Biology has to come up with strategies to deal with the physics that it finds itself in. So let's think about swimming. How do we swim? Well, we tend to flap our arms, right, in some way. And that actually allows us to move through the water. So uh, here's, a, here's a little uh, swimmer, like a bathtub toy, 
It's simply got a paddle, and that paddle's just going to move symmetrically back and forth. And we'll see how well that strategy works in the turbulent regime and in the laminar regime. If I was, as I showed you with the laminar regime with the glycerin, where I was able to undo my motion, if I'm just moving back and forth like this, what do you think? Will I go anywhere? I push the liquid, and then I undo my motion. Where do I wind up? At the same. So you'll see that you stay in the same place. So this individual is very happy with their design. And I'll just uh, try to, can I advance forward here? Anyway, very pleased. And eventually, he'll put this in this tub of water. And not surprisingly, uh, you'll see, see that it uh, will move. All right, here's the no surprise. You put something that flaps, it can move around in the, in the water. And I think in the next one, um, you, the very end of the video, which is taking a bit to get to, is uh, he does it in the sink. Um, and, and you can see it, it swim. Here you go. Voila. So in water, back and forth motion, turbulent flow, it swims just fine. How about in honey? I think this is actually corn syrup. Same swimmer, but this is in the laminar regime. Is it going anywhere? So this is a horrible strategy for an organism that would experience water in the laminar regime. So we don't see any life at the micron scale that just flaps things back and forth in a symmetric fashion. So you need a strategy to overcome that. One particular strategy uh, that some bacteria use is to use a, a helical propeller. This breaks the symmetry. Don't want to get into the details of that argument. But uh, you can see now, and this is a bit slow, but if you watch carefully, the left propeller is pretty much touching the left side of the tank. And by the end of the video, you'll see that it definitely has moved away uh, from the side of the tank. It's spinning very slowly, but nevertheless, it is actually translating as it moves. And so you're still in the laminar regime, but by just Changing your motion from simple back and forth symmetric motion to something which breaks symmetry, uh, you can actually move in the laminar regime. So the other uh, take home message that I wanted to convey about uh, the physics of the laminar regime is that you experience it. We all know that when we're in water, we experience a drag force. Now, the drag force that an object experiences when it's in the laminar regime, uh, it behaves differently than the drag force that we experience when we're swimming through water in the turbulent regime. And for something that is predominantly water, like a living system, it is ultimately, it is, from a mass perspective, it basically has the mass of water. For something of this size, where it is experiencing water in the laminar regime, any force that's acting on it, whether getting a random kick from some neighbor or having some active force which is trying to push you, is immediately balanced by the drag force. So for those of you in high school and you're drawing free body diagrams, this is the free body diagram for a living system moving at, uh, through liquid in the laminar regime. You have some force, which may be active or random, pushing it in green. The drag force is exactly equal and opposite. It experiences the drag force, and it's exactly balancing. So the net force is always zero. And so it moves with constant speed. And the constant speed is simply basically given by the force that is being actively applied to it, divided by some drag coefficient. So that physics is the physics that's gonna, that we're using in our modeling of these types of systems. So 
Um, very simple free body diagram. Uh, the physics of the green force, as we'll see, need not be simple. Um, but uh, so how do things at this scale actually move? And I've got, so there's two predominant ways by which things at the micro scale move. They either move by uh, what's on the top is known as Brownian motion or diffusion which is just there being, the, the movie on the right is just showing a particle in yellow. It's being collided or acted upon by the thermal motion of all the other molecules that are around it, and it's essentially doing a random walk. Interestingly, as I'll show you on the next slide, even though you're doing a random walk, you actually can still move. You actually can still cover distance. The second way uh, which this didn't play. There we go. Get it to play again. Is this going to play again? Here we go. Is uh, sort of your classic molecular motor. So this is a protein. This is kinesin. It's taking in energy and it's actually executing some mechanical motion, exerting a force in a very specific way, and is able to transport cargo. Uh, so that original video I showed you of, of things being tra you know, trafficked around in neurons, it's by this mechanism. There's motors, they're attached to cargo, and they're moving in very specific ways by burning energy and taking mechanical moves to, to direct the motion of the object. And so just a little bit more about the physics of, of these two very distinct types of motion. Uh, maybe I'll start with the, the bottom first since it's intuitive. If I'm moving with constant speed, or in this case I'll even be more specific, constant velocity, and those of you in high school or university physics should know what the difference between velocity and speed is. So if I'm moving with constant velocity, so I'm moving in a straight line with a constant speed, how does my distance depend upon time? If I'm traveling at 30 kilometers an hour in a, in a straight line, after an hour, how far have I gone? 30 kilometers. If I double the time, if, that takes, if I'm traveling at that speed for two hours, how far have I gone? I've gone twice as far as 60 kilometers. So the distance I travel just goes as the time that I'm traveling. That's for something where uh, the motion is active, you're being driven by some engine, which is maintaining your velocity, and you're moving in a, in a directed way. So your distance just goes as the time. For a random walk, and I'm not going to take a the few minutes to show you how to derive this result, you still actually move. Even though you're walking completely randomly, half the time you're going left, half the time you're going right, over time you actually are still spreading out. But interestingly, the distance that you travel doesn't go linearly with time. It goes as the square root of time. And depending upon the scale, that can actually outrun, at the, at the cellular scale, diffusion or, or this random walk can actually outrun that molecular motor that I just showed you, which is walking in a very specific way. So sometimes nature has to choose between, do I want to use the energy required to make a motor and use a motor to move me in a directed way, or can I just use diffusion and let me, you know, jostle around uh, and, and cover distance that way? And there are examples where it uses either strategy. So the picture of kinesin or myosin or dynein, these, these typical molecular motors that are burning energy and making some sort of mechanical motion is not the only way that you can actively move things around in a cell. And so this gets to the, the last part, um, moving towards the last part, which is uh, an alternative mechanism for making directed motion in a cell. And this is a picture actually of, a, unfortunately, a trestle bridge burning in Alberta. Um, but if you were a train and you happened to be on this track, uh, you would never hit reverse, right? you'd always want to keep moving forward because the fire is, is coming up from behind you. And so 
having a, a system where the track is being destroyed behind you rectifies your motion. It makes you only able to head in one way. This also consumes energy. That's why it's called active. So it costs a cell something. It costs it some energy currency to be able to carry this out. But it doesn't require, as we'll see, it doesn't require any sort of mechanical power stroke like you saw with uh, the, the classic molecular motors that uh, you may have read about uh, in a biology text. So I just want to present you with a couple case studies of, of where nature uses this type of mechanism or where it was discovered that nature uses this type of mechanism. The first is uh, sorting the DNA inside your cell. And the cells that I'm considering here are, are bacterial cells. So shown in red and blue are the big chromosomes that exist in the bacteria. The bacteria has replicated its chromosomes, so there's two. One is in red, the, the replicated one's in blue. The cell is dividing, so it's getting bigger. And when it divides, it would like to have the red DNA in one daughter cell and the blue DNA in the other daughter cell. However, there's also genomic information. There's also little pieces of DNA in bacterial cells called plasmids. Those are shown in black there. You may have heard of plasmids here. Some of uh, the fancy cancer treatments these days use plasmids um, to get into our cells. But bacteria have them just by default for carrying kind of the cool functions that the bacteria might have. They actually reside on, they're encoded as information in these plasmids. And when the bacteria is dividing, it would like, if it's got a f only a few number of these plasmids, and they're moving around in the cell sort of randomly, then when they divide, you may not always get the number of plasmids in each, set, in, in each daughter that you'd like to have. So nature has a way for making sure that when the bacteria is dividing, it always gets exactly the same number of plasmids in each daughter cell. How does it do that? Well, some very, you know, biologists do amazing things, and they're able to um, visualize things at the microscopic scale. And what I'm showing you here, so this is a bacterial cell. This here is a bacterial cell. It's, it's growing. It's about to divide. And shown in red there is one of these little circular plasmids. And you can see it's, it's not just moving randomly around in the cell. It's moving back and forth like an oscillation from one side to the other. How on earth is it doing that? You know, as a physicist, that intrigues me, right? It's not doing random motion. It's doing, you know, it's, it's doing something. What if we put, what if we have a cell that has more, more than one plasmid? So it starts with one, but then you get two. And oh, they separate. And they sort of start oscillating sort of in their own neighborhoods, right? And you get three, and then you get four. And whatever underlying mechanism is driving the motion of these plasmids, what it ends up doing is making them so that they're spaced uh, equal, at equal distances along the length of the cell. So when the cell divides in half, you get exactly equal numbers. Pretty clever. So how does this happen? Well, the cartoon that has arisen uh, for the mechanism for such a system, and it's called this sort of burnt bridges ratchet, and hopefully this cartoon conveys to that. It's driven by two proteins that exist in the bacteria. So it's, for a physicist, it's nice, because I only have to worry about two things, two, two molecules. Let's call one of the molecules B. Let's call the other molecule A. So the A molecule is shown here in red. And it decorates the big, giant chromosome inside the bacterial cell. You can think of it like the grass. Like if, if it, you know, you're mowing your lawn, that's your grass. And it's sort of distributed all throughout the bacterial DNA. Shown in black here is one of those plasmids. And attached to it is the other protein, the B protein. And you should think of it about it like Pac-Man or a lawnmower. And it has chemistry with the grass, such that when it interacts with the grass, it removes the grass 
from the surface. So you're like burning your bridge. It's the thing that's active. <laughs> it's actually actively involved in burning the bridge, right? So this plasmid, by the action of the protein that's bound to it, has managed to cut the grass in this area. And it only likes to interact with uncut grass. So it can't take a step backward. It can only move forward. There's no requirement for any sort of power stroke. It's purely just chemistry. You're burning your substrate, and you can't go back to where you've already burnt your substrate. So you have to go forward. And if you put multiple lawnmowers, right, they set up these gradients. The grass grows back. <laughs> so the chemistry in the cell is such that, yeah, the grass got cut off, but it can grow back. And so what ends up happening is you set up these gradients. You move towards uncut grass. Um, and, and it sets up an effective self-repulsion between these plasmids, um, which, which helps to sort them. Where else does it appear? The very, um, more recently, uh, it's been seen in a variety of different systems. Our, our, the bulk of our tissue is made of a protein called collagen. Sometimes the body wants to get rid of it, so there's a machine which uses this burnt uh, bridges mechanism to, to digest collagen. It likes to sort of sequentially move along the collagen, burning through it, and it can't move backwards. Uh, something that's got a little bit more attention, obviously because of the pandemic and so forth, is there are some viruses that also seem to be using this burnt bridges mechanism to search out how to invade a host cell. Thankfully, it's not COVID, but it seems that influenza, this is the way that influenza, when it binds onto our, one of our cells, it sort of starts searching by interacting with certain molecules on our cell surface that act like the grass, and it's the lawnmower. Why might it do, might do that? Well, what it's doing for itself is it's, it's, it's creating a history of, of where it's been. So if you think about searching, right, if you, haven't found what you've, if, if you haven't yet found what you're searching for, you don't want to go back on the path you just came from, right? So if you have a mechanism whereby you can't revisit where you've already been, that's going to be a more efficient search strategy, right? So this burnt bridges method is, is a way to achieve uh, a history dependence in your motion, which for a virus leads to more efficient searches and how to get into your cell. All right, so those are a couple case studies from biology. We have some of the ideas about uh, turning those cartoons using the laws of physics into a predictive model, which I'll just briefly show you here. And so we can actually start trying to predict how are the biological systems actually functioning? Can we make predictions for why they do the things that they do. Well, maybe not why. Why is not, not necessarily a great question with biology, but how they do the things that they do. And then the second thing is, could we also then try to engineer these systems, potentially for treatment purposes, or just for making our own sort of micro or nanotechnology that would use these principles um, to operate at that scale. So here's a little artist rendition for some work uh, that we actually did. So these little balls are like these little micro scale or nano scale lawnmowers uh, via their chemistry interacting with this track. And you can see they're cutting out pathways um, and, and rectifying their motion as they move on the track. Scientists have actually engineered these things out of the context of the cell. So now this is just in a, in a, on a, on a slide that you put under a microscope. And this is actually by a group who took those two proteins which are responsible for sorting DNA in bacterial cells. They made a completely artificial system where they decorated a tiny little microsphere with the B protein, that's the mower protein, and they put it onto a carpet which was a flat surface carpet or a flat surface which is decorated by the A protein to create this sort of chemical carpet, the substrate. 
on the left, if you put those beads on a surface where the carpet doesn't exist, so you, this system is not going to work, you don't have both proteins, they just rattle around and do Brownian motion. They just diffuse. There's no real directionality in their motion. However, if you, if you put those beads onto a surface where the substrate is, where there are other, that complementary protein that they want to interact with, the grass, you can see that they get very directed motion, right? They move predominantly in, in almost straight lines and with constant speed. There's a force that the chemistry exert is exerting. That's an active force. Remember, the drag force is going to exactly balance that. So the net force is zero, but the result is that you move with constant speed or const roughly constant velocity. As you can see, you're moving pretty much in a straight line. That got our attention, right? Here is an engineered system. It's gotten rid of all the messiness of everything else that's inside of a bacterial cell, and you have a very simple system. It's just a you know, styrofoam sphere that's super tiny, but it's got two molecules. And so you could hope to maybe physically, you know, as a physicist, try to understand what's going on. And you can also tweak it, right? You can mess around with it. You can engineer it. Here's a completely different design. So that was, the previous was using these two proteins out of a bacterial cell. This is from another group where they used uh, DNA. You know, the DNA in our cells, there's two strands. They complement each other and they zip together. So what this group did was they put a single strand of DNA, and this was technically, it was RNA, but the idea is simpler to explain if you just take it as DNA. So you got a single strand of DNA is your grass on the surface. And on the little tiny microbead, I put the complementary strand of DNA, right? So they want to zip up. Remember, your double helix is two strands that zip together because they complement each other. So you've got the complementary strand on the sphere interacting with the complementary carpet. They're going to want to stick together. But I need now a mechanism to do some burning, right? Nature has an enzyme which likes to cut not the strands by themselves, but only when they're paired up. So floating around in solution is that green Pac-Man, and it's only going to burn right at the interface where the, the, the DNA is, is paired up. So that's your burning mechanism. And when you put that construct onto uh, and, and view it, it also um, displays directed motion. A little bit more random, right? Not as, a, not as straight as the other system, but, but nevertheless, they showed it. It's definitely not just doing, uh, it's definitely moving with, with a constant speed, but it seems to change its direction more frequently than the previous system. Again, that's sort of like, as a physicist, you're like, oh, OK, here are two different systems sort of using the same principle. One went more straight, the other is going a bit more, uh, or it can change its direction. Why, why might it do that? So my group came up with a, a simple model, and I'll try to end in a, in a couple slides here. Um, but basically, it's got a few components. It's got the, the grass, which is shown in green there. It's got a hub, which, has, which can do chemistry with the grass. And it can remove the grass at some rate, which is sort of shown by those arrows leaving the surface. That's a parameter that we can explore in our model. How fast do you remove stuff from the surface, right? How strongly do you bind to the surface? That's another a parameter. And then the other thing that I want to emphasize is that uh, the surface is actually kind of squishy. It's elastic. You shouldn't view, you shouldn't view the, the grass molecules as just that standing there like rigid objects, but they can fluctuate around like little springs. So there's an elasticity to the substrate, which we can also explore and see how that affects things. And the, the physics is modeled completely by this simple equation. Now, what goes into the right-hand side, F, is the chemistry and is actually pretty complicated, and I'll spare you the equations. But the, the dynamics of how this object moves 
is completely described by this very simple equation. Its speed is directly related to the active force that's being applied to it. So I just highlight a couple things. Motion is constant speed. They show that, it could, that these objects could be rolling or they could actually be slipping. Like a, a tire on a slippery, roll, uh, a slippery road is no longer rolling, it's actually just skidding, right? So we had a couple questions. Can we design the system so that it either rolls or does the skidding motion? What, what, would, what parameters govern whether you go from rolling to slipping? And we decided to focus on the substrate, how sloshy that substrate is. Here's a little movie of our simulation. So this is a rigid substrate. It's still moving around, but you should think of the springs as being pretty stiff. This is a slice, so you just see a hoop rather than the sphere. But you can see that as it's burning the substrate, it's moving from left to right. And there's a little red dot on the hoop. And I hope you can convince yourself that it's actually rotating, right? It's rolling. So on a rigid substrate, this burnt bridges, lawnmower type object at the micron scale, this, remember this is super small, is rolling and moving. If we do this on a sloshier substrate, so the size of the hoop changed, but that was just because I scaled it. It's the same sized hoop. You see that the hoop is moving from still right to left as it burns uh, the material, but the material on the substrate is like sloshing in. You have particles that can reach in and touch the hoop from a great distance and interact with it uh, over much longer distances. And if you've been following the red dot on the hoop, you see that it hasn't rotated very much. And so this motion is com pretty much completely skidding along the surface. And so just by changing the elasticity of the substrate, you can transition from being either rolling on the substrate or skidding along. Engineers like to optimize things. So it turns out that you can get optimal behavior out of these little micro uh, lawnmowers um, by tuning the chemistry, how quickly you're removing the substrate. So there's an optimal speed shown in blue. So you can make these things go uh, at not as fast as you want, but you can, you can achieve an optimal speed. So too, too fast of chemistry, you basically burnt your bridge underneath you and you can't go anywhere, right? You've everything, there's, your landscape is completely toast. Too slow of chemistry also leads to, then you're just getting kicked around by the random collisions that you experience at that scale and you also don't go anywhere. So there's an intermediate chemistry, an intermediate rate at which you cut the lawn that gets you the highest speed. Um, and similarly with whether you, in red is shown whether you roll or you, um, slip. So rolling, there's actually no optimum in rolling as a function of the chemistry. You just always roll better the slower your chemistry. The more chance you have to, to make a sticky connection, the more likely you're going to experience a torque that causes you to roll. And we also explained why the elasticity of the substrate affects how random left to right your motion is. The punchline is basically the softer you make it, the straighter you'll go, the more rigid your substrate, the more chance you have to um, change your direction. And that has to do with the shape of the, the, the burnt region behind you, um, which is illustrated in blue. Softer substrates, you've got bigger burnt regions. Rigid substrates, you have a smaller burnt region. And so with that, I'll, I'll end. Uh, I think I kept it to 45 minutes, thereabouts. Um, so if you forget all of the last half of the talk, hopefully the magic demo is something that will stick with you, that the way microscopic things experience water is way different than the way we experience water. And so thing, life at the microscopic scale has to do things very differently if they actually want to move in this environment. I tried to highlight for you this, this chemistry-driven way of, of, of directing transport. You're burning things, you're using energy. Yes, the cell has to use energy, but you can 
direct things. And um, I didn't get into too much of the details, but I showed you some of our predictions on the engineered systems um, about how our modeling efforts taking the physics about how we know things behave in the laminar regime and the knowledge of the chemistry to make predictions about why these engineered microsystems um, behave the way they do. So with that, I'll end, but it's uh, not my own work. Um, it's the work of a, a few t talented former grad students, uh, Lavisha and Mark, who, who did all this work on uh, motors, both in the context of a cell and also on the engineered systems. And then my current group is currently with uh, Hoda and Amin and Nassim, who are uh, working on things that are completely different. So um, I, myself, am sort of tinkering with this stuff still. Um, but uh, the, the r you know, research efforts change as you, uh, as you go on. Um, happy to take any questions.